Thanks so much, Christine. Guys, we're so excited to have you here this morning. And what better topic than the ability to cover your risk and navigate a truly unprecedented and complex marketplace. Uh, moving forward, it's really critical that you guys have the right policies and practices in place to protect your brokerage, your agents, and your clients. Luckily, Abor's got your back. Today, we're gonna to work to unpack some new resources that we've provided for you. Um, we hope that these will help you navigate industry change like no other, that you might help to improve your professional standards, that you might think about opportunities to improve your actions within the MLS itself. And we wanna to work to answer all of your questions about all of these changing dynamics. We're also gonna unpack ABOR's new broker toolkit series, including our inaugural toolkit for addressing and preventing misconduct, discrimination and harassment within your own brokerage firm, as well as an upcoming broker toolkit that's aimed at addressing common pain points in the field these days. So with that, I wanna jump into our first session. I'd like to start by introducing my co-pilot for this session, Jill Lieber-Knight, the 2021 Vice Chair for the ABOR Diversity Committee. Jill is a master faculty member and mentor at eXp Realty. She's been a realtor and active AWAR volunteer for 16 years, which we truly appreciate. In addition to her role on the diversity committee, Jill's also a past chair for AWAR's vetting committee. Let that be a tiny opportunity for, for me to remind you guys that board applications are open right now and that they close May 31st. And we would love to see some of our small brokers join us in board leadership. If you think that's you, please do hop on abor.com and apply. I've asked Jill to join us here today to walk through how our first broker toolkit came to be, which contains those model brokerage policies for an agent code of conduct, as well as non-discrimination and anti-harassment policies within the brokerage firm. Jill, you want to give us a few words? Yes. Thank you, Ms. Jennifer. I'm so glad to be here with you. Hello, everyone. I, I'm excited to be sharing and talking about this today. And I'm honored to be here as an ABOR Diversity Committee uh, representative and representing my chair, Brandy Winch, and our past chairs, Carrie Parker and Robert Wright, and the many passionate committee members that have served this committee and continue to serve. Um, you know, Emily, I always like to share, if you guys and the listeners don't already know, that ABOR's Diversity Committee has been leading realtor associations across the country with DEI initiatives for several years. And I serve on the Texas State Diversity Committee and I see firsthand the, um, the benefits of having a well-established diversity priority for five years and, and running here at ABOR. So uh, to set the stage for our discussion, uh, you may remember last spring, the social unrest that was happening across our country. Well, our diversity committee was tuned in and following the efforts and conversations that were taking place at NAR and Texas Realtors as they worked to respond to the unprecedented complaints surrounding the discriminatory conduct that was happening online. And our committee recognized and understood that uh, many small and independent brokers didn't have the resources to properly address concerns and complaints associated with harassment, discrimination, and racism. Uh, so the diversity committee launched a diversity and inclusion task force and worked with ABOR leadership and legal counsel to bring this sample documentation that we're gonna discuss today to our membership. And as a committee, we, we know it's important to create something that can assist our brokers in managing their risks in a rapidly changing market, we witnessed, we really truly witnessed the need for those tools during the pandemic. And we hope these tools will expand awareness and have a positive impact um, uh, for the community and the cultural conversations that will carry out the mission of our association and our diversity committee. So Emily, do you wanna, you wanna start discussing this great new broker toolkit? Yeah, well said. Thanks so much, Jill. Um, I'll start just by uh, giving a little bit of a deeper description of what the toolkit really is. And the way that I think about this as the CEO of an organization that employs just over 50 staff members is that I have obligations in a traditional employer relationship to manage an environment that is free of harassment, free of an unruly conduct, free of um, discomfort in the workplace that is in terms of that relationship between us. 
that's a different deal for agents and brokers who are in independent contractor relationships, but to share workspace and still share an environment and a community that they should equally expect to be free of all of these things that could be harmful. And so the intention with the toolkit is really for brokers to define what type of behavior, what type of community you're expecting to perpetuate within your office in terms of interactions between colleagues, interactions between vendors and your agents or vendors and your staff. This gives you some ability to help manage that even outside of that traditional employer employee setting. So the toolkit gives brokers a sample of policies that will help protect their business against agent misconduct within the firm. These policies may or may not be right for each of you, um, but they'll go a starting place. And of course, we always recommend that you work with your legal counsel individually to ensure that any new broker policy you adopt is something that fits cohesively within the context of your business. Um, so, Jill, some of the co some of the components of this of this uh, set of policies includes a code of conduct that applies to who, because this was one of the conversations that we talked a lot about. Who are all the different people that interact in a brokerage firm at any given time? Exactly. Yes. And, you know, we, there was, we, we all witnessed and we were all part of the many conversations that were happening at the time. And, you know, our, our task force, you know, laid out all the pieces of the puzzle and we hashed out and had numerous discussions and researched what other brokers, uh, large and small and, uh, industry organizations, you know, how they were sort of structuring and segmenting this. Yeah, that's a great point is that we did try to take from firms who had already taken a lead on some of these issues, learn from what they were doing in terms of panels of co of uh, peer agents that were reviewing some of these issues or the processes that they were using to investigate areas of concern. All of those things were um, outlined in the work of this task force. So the code of conduct defines who, or the policies define who the code of conduct applies to, clearly defines what behavior is will not be tolerated and is inappropriate and more importantly out, outlines a complaint and investigation procedure that allows you to equitably consider every complaint that is filed it also outlines potential disciplinary action should you want to define that in your policy so that you can set expectations about what will happen if somebody violates these policies next slide all right uh, so our sample policy also encourages you to help define your agency's commitment to diversity and inclusion. Joe, we had a lot of conversation about what, what brokers should be thinking about in terms of how they define for their agents what they care about. Um, do you want to speak to any of that? Yeah, and we, we had, yes, we did have a lot of really passionate and, and diverse conversations around this. But again, we, we interviewed a lot of, uh, of different uh, local and national brokerages and organizations. And, you know, we were, we were recognizing trends where the one, the organizations that had a more clear uh, communication and commitment to what they stood for meaning what what they would not stand for, um, that it was easier for them to support disciplinary behavior once they had a very clear vision of what they were about and what mattered to them. So that was an interesting part of the process because we initially thought that we were lost more in human resource type uh, policies and behavior. But uh, what, it, what it led us to do is decide, you know, to encourage people to ask themselves and think about you know, where their stand was, what's what what they were and were not willing to tolerate in terms yeah, of I think, their yeah, mission. I think that's a great, yeah, no, that's a great, great comment. I, you know, I can recall the conversation being, if you asked any given broker if they would tolerate ra racism in their firm, they would all say no. But how many of them had made proactive statements and commitments towards their commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion as areas of um, concern in areas where they wanted to really define the guardrails. That's the purpose of a policy like this. Absolutely. And, you know, I think, you know, when we were getting lost in a lot of the detail, it was really easy. I remember that conversation that day where we were like, well, what do we stand for? And, and it, it became very clear. And when we were able to get to that step, uh, a lot of things started to fall together. 
Yeah, love it. So um, I'm going to go to the next slide and just go ahead and, and offer you guys some call to action as small brokers. We hope that you will work with your legal counsel to ensure that your brokerage has policies like this. If this best practice policy or this sample draft policy is not the right one for you, we just want you to think about what is the right set of policies and get them on board within your policy manual. Um, obviously, even if you think that this is perfect right off the shelf, and we hope you do, we still want you to run it through your legal counsel just to be safe. The next thing we want to ask you to do is to integrate training on all of your brokerage policies for all of your new hires that you're onboarding every new agent that you onboard. I think we work really hard up front to try to get agents up and running in the business and that's absolutely prudent and appropriate. What you also need to do is ensure that they understand the rules on the playground, both within your own brokerage, but also within the larger marketplace. We're going to talk a little bit later about MLS enforcement and compliance. That's another great topic for you to really incorporate into that onboarding process so that your agents are set up for success up front. And then the last thing we want to remind you to do is to train annually against these policies and all of the others. It's really easy to get into this business on the right foot and then get on the wrong foot a few years later when we forget some of the things that we learned when we first started. So having that kind of annual touch base with your agents, just as we do with our staff on an annual basis about what the rules are, what expectations you can have of the firm, how we agree to operate within the community that we share. All of those things are just efforts to both mitigate your risk and keep people um, in compliance and in alignment with the culture that you're trying to perpetuate within your firm. Jill, do you want to add anything that you think will yeah. be important for these guys? I, I, I will say we had some small brokers, some independent brokers on uh, the task force and just yeah. the exercise of reviewing a policy, they, they recognize that that would be a great annual exercise. Even the exercise, whether you agree or, or tweak or adjust uh, this toolkit that we've created, it's a great exercise to kind of examine and evaluate all the different uh, aspects of it. So you know, I, I love the training being an ex school teacher. I think the annual training will be really great, but even as an exercise to really kind of dig apart, dig, dig through and examine what has been created. Awesome. I think that's a great point. Just be, be sure to gut check around what you've got on paper and make sure that it still matches where you are today. Yeah. Well, well, Jill, thank you so much. I know that we're going to take questions at the end of our three segments. So you're going to come back and join us in a little bit, but with that, I think we're going to move on to our next section. Next up, I've got Kalea Youngblood. She is the Avor Chief Marketing Officer. Kalea is certainly the glue that coordinates all of our operations across Avor and the Actress MLS. She serves not just as the Chief Marketing Officer of the organization, but is also a leader that helps pushes professionalism across all facets of our work together. Kalea is here, together, or here today to announce hot off the press our new broker toolkit. So the second in this series of three that we're going to provide you in risk mitigation tools. Please help me welcome Clay Youngblood. Hi, good morning. Thanks for joining us today. I am excited to share with you an exclusive firsthand look at our new broker toolkit that we will launch to brokers actually later this afternoon. So uh, John, if you would take us up, oh, oh, he's already there to our next slide. Thank you so much. So, you know, ironically enough, today's market reminds me of my selling days through the 2008 recession and managing agents when sales were so tight and anxiety was so high. And while today we are in this astonishingly hot market, sales are also tight and anxiety is super high. And what I found to be true in both scenarios is that we are coming across the same bad habits from poorly written contracts to the inability to get a hold of an agent to risky negotiation tactics, ABOR has been receiving an increased number of complaints from agents and brokers who are just frustrated with the interactions and experiences that they are having in the field. So we wanted to help our brokers, we wanted to help you with these market dynamics. And so we chatted with Avis Wukash, broker, you may know her, broker and former Trek uh, Commission Chair, and Carrie Lewis, a real estate attorney and also the former Trek general counsel. They have started a new little business called Two Old Chicks on Real Estate, uh, which is a business designed to help reduce the risk license holders face in transactions. So we, der we derived this broker toolkit to help you manage risk in today's housing market, which includes guidance for you as brokers, as well as some shareable resources for agents uh, that we hope that you will share onto your teams. 
John, let's switch to the next slide, please. This is a, a top five tips for brokers. And what bubbled up in our conversation were these five tips that you can do to both help you manage risk to your brokerage, but also help your agents navigate this tough market. So from a high level, keeping your policies updated and ensuring your agents understand them is super important. It is easy to have agents sign your handbook and put it on a shelf to check the box, but now more than ever, brokers need to be able to prove they've done everything they can to prevent agents from being incompetent and or negligent. I would even recommend breaking down each of your office policies, like we talked about previously with Jill and Emily, um, and talking to your agents, break those policies down and talk to your agents at each sales meeting or maybe include policy highlights in your regularly uh, regular communications to your teams and agents. I think one of the hardest things to juggle as a broker, especially if you're a selling broker, is to be available to your agents what feels like 24 seven and ensure their contracts are reviewed and completed correctly. We know that in this market, contracts and negotiations are becoming increasingly complex and time is of the essence to submit offers. So we just encourage you to gut check your systems, make sure that you have plans in place when you are unavailable to respond to the needs of your agents in a timely manner. Other issues that keep bubbling up are poorly written contracts, dangerous escalation clauses, practicing law and special provisions, and not securing proper buyer and seller representation. We strongly encourage agents to use standardized TREC and Texas Realtors forms whenever possible. One of the fastest ways, as you know, agents get in trouble is relying too heavily on special provisions, which may have, um, have to be written by the client's attorney. If there is a specific situation or issue that keeps occurring for your agents that is not addressed in any of these forms, you may want to engage your legal counsel to draft a proprietary addendum for all of your agents to use. Just a little tip there. Next slide, John. Now these are tips for your agents. Also included in the broker toolkit that we are launching this afternoon are tips that you can literally cut and paste and share with your agents to help you mitigate risk. Listed here are the high level issues we are hearing about that are causing frustration and creating chaos and are super risky. The big one is obviously the unauthorized practice of law. We see it more often than we'd like to admit. And with there being so many nuances of transactions in this hot market, it is tempting to try to get an edge by writing in special provisions or using an escalation clause to get a leg up, but they can cause more harm than good to get and get you into hot water. So remind your agents, to be very careful about writing in spe special provisions and skip the escalation clauses and use appraisal contingency forms correctly. If a client insists on using any of these tactics to get in the door, then we definitely you know, want you to seek the counsel of an attorney. All right, I wanna talk about the elephant in the room, which is communication etiquette. I would bet that you have heard all of the complaints about how agents can't get a call back or the showing instructions weren't clear or they lost out on a house because the agent remarks said that they would hold offers until Sunday at five, but they accepted an offer on Friday instead. So we're hearing that too. We get all of these emails with people who are so frustrated about the lack of communication and professionalism in the industry. So this toolkit outlines the top tips for agents to play fair in the sandbox and communicate equitably. Our hope is that this is an easy way for you to provide reminders to your agents and teams on the dues. And for the love of almighty power, I will set your license back to Trek. Do not. Um, we want you to take this and use it as that tool. To truly address professionalism in our industry, agents need to hold each other accountable. So we encourage you to file an, an ethics violation when you see it. Talk to the other broker about the issue. And if it cannot be resolved, let's file a complaint with Texas Realtors. All right, John, let's move on to the next, sli next slide. All right, and lastly, here's what the entirety of, the, of what the broker toolkit will cover. We hope you will find it helpful and we hope you will use it as a risk mitigator and a reminder to your professionals to be professional. Thanks everyone. Christine, I think you're up. So yes, now we have um, Stan. We'd like to bring up Stan Martin, um, who is part of our MLS uh, CEO. 
COO, sorry, wrong C's. Um, and we'd like to bring him to the stage to go over our MLS compliance changes. Welcome, Stanley. Thank you, Christine. Uh, I'm so happy to be here. It's been quite some time since I've been able to meet with the small brokers and got some important announcements to make today. Um, as you know, uh, John, uh, you can go to the next slide. Uh, as you know, NAR has passed a number of new policies over the last 12 to 18 months. And those changes uh, have been a long time coming. Uh, if you think about the market conditions that we're facing now, the, the changes were right on time. And our board of directors has been reviewing these NAR policy changes and created a task force. The task force met for three to four months looking at these policy changes and have recommended a new compliance plan, an enforcement plan that is an overall shift of our strategies. We've taken and rewritten the, the rules um, to be in order with this compliance plan. And I'm asking you today as, as brokers, I mean, it's important that you work with your agents and you're proactive in this change because right? you have a responsibility uh, to your agents and to the marketplace as much as the MLS does. And we, we have to play our role in implementing this new plan and, and enforcing that everyone is uh, playing by the rules, but you are critically important to working with your agents, being proactive. Uh, it's only to serve all of our members, but I mean, it's really truly serves uh, the independent smaller brokers in a marketplace uh, when they are cooperating together. Uh, John, next slide, please. So um, basically what did we do? We took and created three categories in line with the NAR policy changes. Category one are your standard typical infractions of listing information. Category two are infractions relating to IDX and VOW, VOW policies. And category three are those more significant infractions when we're talking about unauthorized use, uh, misuse of MLS data, uh, mandatory submission, reporting of sold data. We have strengthen the process uh, in the, in, and penalties for category three. Uh, John, next slide, please. So for basically for category one, uh, we will receive, you'll receive three notifications on, for example, if you don't put in the right number of bedrooms, you'll receive three notifications. If you do not comply with those notifications, then it will escalate to a warning. Beyond a warning, there may be monetary penalties. There may be uh, classes that you have to take up to a hearing panel. This is a new uh, requirement with the NAR policy. And what it basically will entail is that both the listing agent and the broker will have to come down to the board or through a remote video uh, and hear and listen to uh, a panel about what the violation was and a determination will be made if a penalty, a monetary fine and or up to suspension is required uh, for that violation. In the past, brokers would not necessarily come in when these penalties were, were escalated. Uh, and that is all changing um, with these new policies. Next slide, please. So what's really neat about this whole program that we've put together is that it, it's a plan. I mean, it's a process. There are four competencies that we built this around. Training, support, correction, and enforcement. We do not uh, want to 
change the rules, implement these policies, and not have some uh, foundational aspects to it. So for training, you will see uh, new courses being rolled out. You'll see more communication on these rules, the ability to take a class uh, when you receive fines will be reinstated. For support, we are building out a data quality team that will have a four person team. Uh, staff is being trained now on the rules. For correction, both staff and brokers will be empowered to understand these categories, be empowered to make these corrections. Uh, all of these rules are with the mind of fixing the problem, fixing the infraction, not punishing. Um, you know, yes, we do have to have penalties, but our goal is to correct the problem. And then consistent compliance um, enforcement, that is paramount to, to making this work. So not only with working with you, the brokers, um, training the staff, training the agents, but having these clear categories, rewriting the rules so that they can be as clear as possible to the agents, and then having consistent processes in place uh, to enforce those rules. Next slide, please. And why are we doing all of this? It's, it's the data. If you talk of you know, the listing data is the most important resource that we provide and it's why we are here. Um, data priorities include accurate information, includes complete information, not that, yes, the bedrooms uh, are correct, but complete information that you have all of the fields entered. Um, timely information, when you submit statuses, pending, sold, that needs to be done within 24 to 48 hours so that the cooperating brokers and agents are, are being most efficient. And that all rolls into just being reliable. If we've got accurate and complete and timely data, then our subscribers can rely on that information. Um, you know, we have made a commitment to you know, our mission, to our vision, to be the authoritative source for all Central Texas real estate information and compliance and enforcement is a key aspect of that. John, next slide. So again, you know, please pay close attention to upcoming communications. We have just started to, to roll this out. Um, we sent a communication this week. They're, we're working through this plan. It's a comprehensive plan, so it's going to take several more months. And we wanted to get a communication out because that's a commitment that we made to our, to our brokers um, last year, that we would provide 90 days notice uh, to our membership before we made any further changes. So as we work in parallel, um, please look for these communications um, and begin to encourage your agents to carefully review uh, the listing data. Look at your practices, your, in, your listing input practices. The, the primary uh, violation complaints that we get usually are around category one that has to do with listing input, just incomplete or inaccurate information. Category two, category three, those are, are less frequent but still critically important. IDX and VAL rules are the display of listings on the internet. And we will begin to have a systematic review of all websites. Um, that also is part of this. And then for category three, you know, not reporting sold, sharing keys, uh, cooperating by, by listing properties uh, in, in the MLS, you know, that is going to be an increased focus uh, this fall. So begin to have this conversation with your agents uh, and prepare them. Next slide. Yeah, so <laughs> just repeating this again, but uh, I can remember being able to pick up the phone 
and calling our longtime loyal brokers and the markets. There's a lot of, there's a lot of chaos in the market right now, but as staff being able to pick up the phone and call a broker and that broker is gets it. They understand they want to cooperate. They want to follow the rules. They want their agents to be the best. And you work with that broker. We don't need fines and penalties and uh, to get the job done. Those brokers help us as staff. And that's, that's the partnership that, that we want to have again. And we're, the pendulum uh, is swinging back. Uh, if you've been with us for a long time. You understand that you know, in the long time ago, uh, this was uh, routine and we're finding a new middle ground again, uh, moving forward. So uh, thank you for, for working with us. Thank you for cooperating and we'll probably open it up here for additional questions. Yeah. So guys, uh, we're happy to take questions from you in the Q and a feature of the zoom webinar. So I know we had a hand up, but if you would be willing to either chat that question or put it in our Q and a, then we'll be able to pick it up for you. Welcome to ask questions on any of the three segments that were just offered. We're all here to hang out or we can give you your time back in your day. I'm not seeing any yet. Let me keep an eye here. Uh, Leo Welsh asked a great question. Oh, here we go. Good. What do we think is a reasonable amount of time for an agent to answer your call, email, email or text? In this market? <laughs> like yesterday. <laughs> Kalea might want to speak to that also, but I do. I, I think um, I, I could say that given the pace of the market and the expectations of your clients, I believe that the expectation is pretty darn fast. Now that said, being present with the client that you're with, being present in the meeting that you're in currently is also critical to ensuring a high level of professionalism in your business. So within, you know, two to four hours, probably. Jill, you, as a practitioner, what would you say to that? I absolutely, I mean, I agree two to four hours is an ideal, uh, but you know, a lot of us are working with clients and we're out in the road and you know, our priority is to be present with them. Um, but I don't know if I know a lot of realtors that don't know how to multi, <laughs> not that multitasking is always the best way to function, sure. but, um, yeah, I certainly think within the day, um, you know, if, if the, you know, the communication reach out was in the morning by lunchtime, if it was in the afternoon before the end of the business day, but certainly not uh, waiting the next business day. Yeah, we've got another question about how this information will be shared with even our large brokers. All of the broker toolkits are also shared with the larger uh, broker community. We just decided to launch with this community first because you guys have been engaged with us for so long and are so proactive in adopting these tools. So this is our first step, but they'll definitely continue on with others. Here's a question, What are what is, what are or is the IDX and VOW, and what are the violations related to that? So Stan, let's first define IDX and VOW. This is a source of a lot of confusion. Yeah, great question. Uh, they are policies, first and foremost. So sometimes we get confused and think that they're a thing, um, but they're policies. Internet Data Exchange and Virtual Office Website is what they stand for. And Internet Data Exchange is the mechanism that allows brokers to cooperate and share their listings with each other on the internet. As you all know, you cannot advertise another broker's listing, but through cooperation in the MLS, you are granting cooperating brokers the, the right to advertise that listing on their company website, Internet Data Exchange. Virtual office website, similar concept, similar rules, but the main principle behind virtual office website or concept is that you're a broker who is conducting business online. So anything that you can do in a brick and mortar, anything you can do in person with a client, you the concept is that you can do that same, provide that same level of service online through a virtual office website. 
And so what you'll notice over the years, this has been standard policy now uh, going over 11, 12 years now, and brokers will put up additional services on their company website. You'll, consumers will go and register on that site. They create a broker consumer relationship, not necessarily a broker client relationship with a signed representation agreement, but it's just the threshold on the web, you read it to some terms of use, create, a, create an account, and then they can use those additional services. They can see additional off-market properties, um, sold listings, for example, behind a password on a virtual office website. So the other part of that question was, uh, what are the penalties, right, for that? Um, if you are not participating in IDX, if the broker is not participating in IDX, and for example, they were then advertising listings, a cooperating another broker's listings on that website, that would be a violation of IDX. 99% of all of our brokers participate in IDX. Only a, just a few do not. Um, and you know, that is your choice as a broker. You can opt out of IDX, uh, but then you would not be able to advertise listings, other brokers listings on your website. And that would be a warning and now a, a monetary penalty uh, if you violated that rule. Similar with VAL, if you were not complying with VAL rules, you would receive a warning first. If you did not comply, then there would be a monetary penalty. And Stan, just to follow up on compliance uh, question as well, the right way to submit complaints or concerns around violations is to send an email to? Uh, yes, uh, support at abor.com is your source all the time to or send- any type of complaint. Any, any type, type of complaint. Anything uh, related to service, support, and or complaints. It will be funneled and routed to the right department and uh, handled accordingly. Great. Yendra, I see your comment. Some companies will not let their lockbox open by setting it up, but I'm not sure of exactly what the question is there. So if you want to chat us a little more detail, we'll be sure to try to follow up on that. Um, you, may, there just, was a you can set the access hours on a lockbox. That's, that's for seller preference, listing agent preference, that may be a setting that's not done correctly or they truly don't want access at that point in time in the lockbox. Yeah, and then um, in terms of there being a tool within the MLS to submit an error, really the best way to report any concern around data within the MLS, a potential violation of one of these business rules out in the marketplace, is to use email support at abor.com. There is an opportunity within the MLS to give user feedback on um, glitches or things that you think might be happening within, but the easiest and most straightforward way to report any concern is to use support at, or, uh, support at abor.com and just so that we can capture that, measure it, be sure that we're seeing if that's something that's happening on a recurring basis. So support at abor.com is your best friend. <laughs> I gotta um, say everyone, as a guest that is an agent and not a broker, um, all these toolkits just make it seem, you know, it, it, it's very comforting and, uh, you know, helpful to know that, that my brokers and broker community is, is pulling together and, and tidying things up. There's just something about the word toolkit that makes me wanna just, you know, tidy up and, and clean up systems. Thank you so much. Uh, Yendra has a great question too about what happens if, if there's a perception that a larger company is not treating another company equitably. Um, you know, listen, we, we hear these concerns in the marketplace and there are certainly tools to help address that type of unethical behavior, both within the guidelines that Trek provides about the way that business is to be conducted, but also under your obligations and guidelines within the code of ethics. Kalea, you could speak a little bit to the fact that some of those resources um, regarding how you take action when you feel like something like that is happening um, it, are built into the new toolkit and also always available on our website. Yes, absolutely. You know, just a reminder that um, Trek and Texas Realtors have comprehensive 
um, processes with regards to the legal hotline. If you have you 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 have a question or you're not super sure, should I file a complaint or this is happening or I've seen this happen a couple of times. Remember, there's the Texas Realtors Hotline where you can speak to legal counsel about those things, um, and then also you can always email us and we can you know send you to the right place if there's a, a question. Um, but we do encourage you to raise the flag. So if there's something that is happening, don't just, you know, oh, I'm going to be, I might have to work with this person again. Or, you know, if you truly think that something is wrong, raise the flag. And that's really the bottom line. The resources are uh, in the uh, document library on neighbor.com. We have resources on the Texas Filters website as well. There's been resources going here in the chat. So uh, bookmark those, make sure that you have easy access to those, and you can always email us at supportedabor.com too if you just have a general question that you're not sure about. And Kalea, while I've got you, let's talk about multiple offers and the deadlines being ended earlier. early. When someone takes a contract before their stated deadline, is it truly a violation? Yes. If you've put something in the MLS that says, I'm going to take offers through 5 p.m. on Sunday and you've created an offer or you've you've gone under contract or you've accepted an offer at 5 p.m. on a Friday, that is a violation. So what you say in the MLS needs to remain true and your agent remarks need to be on point and your showing instructions need to be on point. Great. Deborah Lewis, um, awesome question about how she'll be able to access these links and resources when the chat goes down and the webinar is over. We will, um, I think what we could also commit to pretty easily is to maybe sending out an email with some of the links that we've provided and certainly access to the toolkit for the attendees following this program. So um, Christine has also provided all uh, uh, like a one source or a one place meets all resource for some of the complaint and violation issues, but we'll be sure to get all of that out to you guys following the program. Other questions, concerns? You know, ultimately, guys, I think what what I would most want you to know as CEO of the Austin Board of Realtors is that we know that it's wild and woolly out there. We know that the pace of this marketplace creates a certain level of chaos and a certain level of angst and stress in each of you. We want to try to relieve that for you as best we can by providing a best practice, a set of standards that we think will help the market operate more smoothly and with less chaos. Um, but ultimately, it takes the partnership of all of our brokers, all of our agents across the marketplace to make those things work in market. So we appreciate your willingness to be here today, to listen to this conversation, be a part of learning and understanding what resources are available for you and your agents. And we just really encourage you to reach out where you need help. Support at abor.com, you could send darn near anything and we'd figure out how to, how to address it and get it to the right spot. But that is a one-stop shop for you and we want you to try to use that that line, that lifeline as an opportunity to communicate when you think you need help or when you think you see something that's not right. So with that, we're going to give you just a few minutes back in your day. We so appreciate that you spent your morning with us this morning. We're lo looking forward to seeing you guys soon. Thanks so much. Thank you.